Hey everybody, welcome to Dev Better. Uh, today we have a really fun episode. I have some friends with me uh, that um, I've known for a while. Let's do some quick introductions. Um, Kendrick, say hello. Hello, uh, I'm a staff software engineer here at Seven Factor. I've been working here for just about a year now. Yep, and Jesse? I've uh, been doing software dev for a little over 20 years now. Uh, currently working in uh, in Denver as a, a regional GM for Artium, but uh, known this guy for a long time. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So uh, cool. Today, we're going to talk about test-driven development. Uh, in typical dev better fashion, I want to just briefly monologue about the problem, and then we're going to talk about three myths in test-driven development that we think people should stop believing and why we think they should stop believing them. All of us have had a lot of experience building software for startups and for enterprise companies. So this will be a really good uh, meaty episode where we talk about some of the, the, the prickly things that developer don't necessarily enjoy. All right, so test-driven development, what is it? It's a controversial way, unfortunately, uh, to build software that is sorely misunderstood uh, in my experience. Kent Beck is credited with rediscovering test-driven development as a general method to build software. He's written a lot of books on the topic. He's also written a book on extreme programming, which I recommend. XP is an interesting uh, way to pair. It, it defines how you pair and how uh, developers can work together more socially to build better code, which is a really good thing. Um, I personally didn't discover TDD until I was well into my career. It wasn't something that was just taught to me. Um, I had already learned a lot of testing anti-patterns because I was writing the tests after I wrote production code. Uh, and I unfortunately had to unlearn a lot of that stuff when I was practicing test-driven development. Um, and the key concepts are really, really good things that we'll dig into here. Um, we want to build behaviorally driven tests with small, elegant implementations that are easily understood. And we also want to refactor obsessively, which is uh, something that the business doesn't necessarily like, uh, but we have to explain why it's a good thing. Um, uh, and, and we want to refactor, create the simplest solution for the problem at hand, right? Occam's razor for philosophy fan, the simplest answer is probably the right answer. So the red green refactor loop is often been maligned um, by misguided engineers, in my opinion, and even some technically adjacent business folks uh, due to a misunderstanding of how that technique is properly applied. And we can talk about that. Um, people often claim that test-driven development is slower, ineffective, wasteful. Um, these observations, unfortunately, are only skin deep, right? Uh, there are some compromises that we can make to avoid some of the more trivial arguments against TDD, like don't TDD constructors. Um, but the guiding philosophies and the underlying ideas of test-driven development are excellent ways to build quality into your software engineering pipeline. So with that being said, we have three myths that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, and we're just gonna keep this open and free and chat about all kinds of fun things. Um, so let's talk about the first myth. Uh, Kendrick, Jesse, tell me what you guys think. Uh, myth number one, test-driven development is slow. My opinion on this, yeah, it can be, but maybe you should be going slower. <laughs> Let's start with Jesse. What do you think? Well, yeah, and and that's that's always the excuse I hear uh, right off the bat is, well, it's going to slow me down. It's going to slow me down. It's like, no, it's going to prove it works before you even hit the button. <laughs> like, like yeah. development starts to become boring. Like, oh, no, the thing that I do is going to be predictive and slow. Oh, wait, no, it's not going to be slow because I'm never going to have to worry about that thing again. Right. Uh, that's been... That's been around since the start of writing tests began, as, as far as I've known. Yeah, and e even writing tests after, to some degree, will get you that, but it won't get you that in the way TDD does, because TDD tends to skew more towards behavioral tests, right? And mm -hmm. testing class stacks, as opposed to just testing individual um, methods and mocking the crap out of everything around it. Um, Kendrick, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, the um, I think the, the big thing to remember um, in software development in general, uh, especially you know as you, as you approach agile methodologies and whatnot, uh, is that slow is fast, right? Getting it right the first time and knowing that it's going to go out correct gets you into a situation where you, you send it out and it's done, right? I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't have to think about regressions on my code base because I've got that tested, right? I've, I've got this behavior defined as a test. I can come in and I can look at my test suite and say, oh, that's what that's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then I come in later and make a feature enhancement or touch some, you know, adjacent code. And I make, I, I break something. There's no regression there because my test failed. And it told me, hey, you broke this. Go back and fix it, right? So taking the, the time upfront to make sure that you've got a reliable and usable test suite can make it so that Sure, it takes a little bit of extra time to get going, but you never have to take a step back, right? right. And the worst thing that you can do is, is you know, deploy something and then you got to step back and, oh, that thing we deployed last week, it's got a bug. Can we go back and fix it, right? Because you're context switching, you're just wasting time at that point, right? So better to take your time, get it right the first time, <clears> and be done with it. 
To me, it's like TDD is fast, right? I interrupted you on no, purpose. No, no, you can't. It's you fast. Can't. It's faster because uh, you get it right. Uh, you know, you, you implement the, the the behavior that you're looking to build, and then assuming you did TDD right, which is another big big problem I found is a lot of people don't do TDD right. They're like, oh yeah, I'm doing test driven. I'm like, no, you're not. Like, no, you're not. You're you're just writing tests and claiming it's TDD or Maybe you write the test first and then you kind of make it pass and you don't ever do anything on the refactor side of the house, which is the most important piece, in my opinion, of TDD. So it's not slow because in the hands of trained engineers that know how to how to do this, it's not a slow endeavor. In the hands of inexperienced folks, like when I started picking it up, yeah, absolutely, it's going to be slower because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm trying to figure out as I go no. how to make this whole thing work. Did you have something you were going to say? Well, yeah, and, and the other the other side of that is too, and this is the for the for the business itself. Everyone's like, well, that's a tech thing. I don't care. It's like, what if I told you I can bring in a new developer, drop them in, and they won't break anything without knowing it. Yeah, and they may not have that domain knowledge. They may not know those words, but they'll be like, hey, this thing broke, and it's called yada yada. What what is that? And everyone goes, oh no, get out of there. <laughs> like that's a huge superpower that that right. people leave out. <laughs> like like I don't have time to go talk to Jeremy every single time something happens, so I can just ask the code because the code knows. Like right. it's it's right. the source of truth and justice, right? It's like it's like right. yeah, you broke it <laughs> when you can when you can go to your tests and read the tests to understand the expectations. You've you've got a whole other form of documentation that is leaps and bounds above pretty much anything else, right? Yeah. Because the, the tests are true, because that's what's currently yeah. happening in the code base, right? Your uh, your documentation and confluence to whatever, right? That can quickly get oh, over. God. But as long as you're, you know, doing proper TDD, those tests are going to tell you what's supposed to happen, right? So that's, wanna, that's a well, great way. But you want to talk slow, let's talk about documentation oh, and confluence. God. How many, <laughs> how many times My, has that actually been up to date? My, uh, the, the when I write it, it was. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. The moment you write it, it's it's true. But after that, get it. My my personal favorite is is everyone's like, well, well, it's written down, it's good. I'm like, okay, so go ask three people how it works and get four opinions. Exactly. Like no one knows because everyone thinks it works a different way. It's like, right. let me let me just look at the code and I can tell you. And that's so much faster than wasting like I don't know how many meetings on average would that be? <laughs> at least four. At least right. four meetings. <laughs> where we have to talk about meetings to talk about the meetings for for doing the thing. You know, I love what you mentioned, Jesse, about how you're you're bringing it even into organizational swiftness, right? You're saying that take a junior engineer and throw them into a code base and say, just go ask the code base questions, right? If it if if you broke it, you know you broke it. Yeah. Go fix it, right? Yeah. Look, read the read the freaking test. That's you're a developer. You should be able to read a test. Um, and I love that that concept because that speeds you up from an onboarding perspective because everybody loses developers pretty quickly these days right we're all we're people seeing like expensive. super high turnover in our fields since the whole RTO thing is happening every people are just like leaving left and right so now we have to figure out how to onboard a brand new engineer because i've lost one like mm -hmm. i think all of my clients right now have at least lost one engineer a piece oh, in each yeah. one of their their individual um organizations so i love that you you also bring it home to organizationally TDD can be a faster way to build software and and so so that's cool. Yeah, yeah. It insulates it insulates me from like from the uh, putting the business hat on, right? It insulates me from a developer wanting to oh I don't know take a vacation. Yeah, God forbid we can't take vacation. It's, it's not allowed, right? It's not allowed. And, and like like I was in a situation where somebody wanted to like they had been working way too many hours, and we finally got onto a spot, and I'm like I'm like can you start writing some tests at least so that we can insulate this one spot, right? And and that is that that enabled that person to go on vacation. Right. So as time rolls on, I'm like, this is this is just a great way to do things. Right. Uh, and, and it's not just quality of software because it's boring, but it's also like it helps the culture. Right. And we can also talk about the speed of maintainability. Like, I don't think anybody's putting metrics or ideas around how fast can you maintain code, right? Because this is something I don't hear people talking about. I don't think so either. If you have a bunch of, of tests that define how the code operates and you've used test-driven development, coming in and refactoring that to make it more readable and maintainable. Let's say that I get a ticket and it's something that Jesse's worked on or something that Kendrick's worked on. And I'm in there and doing things and I see, okay, I don't understand. There's a little piece of code that's kind of weird to me because you know they're smarter than me and they figured out how to write it really elegantly. And I just don't know what that is. I want to refactor that because I'm a junior developer. I want to refactor that in a way that I understand the code. I can do that and, and run my test and it proves that I didn't break anything. Now there's arguments as to whether or not you should be doing that, right? That's a different conversation. A lot of uh, business folks see refactoring as a waste of money, which trust me, it's not. 
Um, but uh, it's still a good, a good, um, it's that whole regression suite that you're here, right? If you're working in like old school enterprise, we talk about regression testing and smoke <laughs> testing and all these things I've heard over and over again, beaten into my skull from 500 different, you know, giant multi-billion dollar corporations, you know, we are able to make changes to the code base and be bold about it. And that's very important for speed, because if you're more confident, guess what? You're going to go faster. Huh. Well, and, and someone's going to know. Exactly. Like, like I can I can pull out objects and move them to the side and then rerun them and go, okay, good. Didn't break a thing. Now it's time to mess this thing up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the second myth, uh, which is that test-driven development is wasteful. So we kind of hit on some of this in our previous diatribe. Um, but why do you think people think it's wasteful? Like, what are some of those core, where does that argument come from, do you think? <laughs> I think one of the big things you're going to see that, that, that stemming from is people who don't know how to write good tests, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're writing tests that are specific to your implementation, right? And then you're told, oh, you do, you do red, you do green, then you refactor, right? And you write this test that's, that's testing your implementation, then you go and try and refactor it. Well, now your tests are broken because you've just changed how you're doing the work. And your test was looking at the implementation instead of the behavior of those tests, right? And so someone who, who doesn't understand how to approach testing from a behavioral standpoint uh, and, and just instead focuses on writing implementation feels like every time I change my code, my test breaks. So what's the point, right? Mm. <laughs> so, Literally the point. It is uh, the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and this is funny too, because um, I, you know, I've heard, well, well it's, I, I have to I, let's just throw away code. And I'm like, no, you're doing the smallest thing because you mm -hmm. don't know really how to implement. Well, I know how to do that. No, the tests are going to prove that you have done it and you have not done that yet. Therefore, right. It's it's it, like those two things don't correlate. Like they just yeah. don't. Um, because again, going back to the philosophical, well, if you ask how somebody works, it's, oh, it's going to be three, you know, three people, four opinions, whatever. Right. Um, I, I I found that that the wastefulness of refactoring um, helps me convey it better to the next person. For sure, like, I, I'm using that as a communication channel to be like, no one's going to be able to read this. Like I did that. <laughs> so it, like back in the day in .NET, tuples came out. Yeah. And I did a, uh, well, tuples and funks came out and I did like a funk T, tuple T, boolean, <laughs> something like some really wild code. I committed <laughs> it and then I immediately refactored it. I was like, there's no one that's going to be able to read that. And and even uh, one of the developers, like, because we we're all in the same room, he just like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like... I Give me a minute. You just check that in. Seriously? No, right. I think the the other thing that like you you said it really well, like refactoring is something that people view as a wasteful thing, but it, we know it to, to not be. Um, you know, it, engineers that are watching this show, you probably were like, yeah, of course refactoring isn't wasteful. I'm gonna tell you right now though, there are people out there that think wow. that refactoring is a waste of your time and that you should be just shipping features into production. And while shipping features into production is definitely the goal. That's why we do this. We don't sit around like, de well, there are some developers probably that do this, but most engineers aren't sitting over here going, I just want to play in code all day and just write pretty code. I mean, it is a bit artful to write very well, elegantly abstracted code, but it's not really what we want to do all, the, all day. We want to ship things to, to production, right? So thinking that refactoring is wasteful is 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 absolutely not true because of all of the benefits that you get from spending 10 minutes. Here's the other thing, guys, I'm telling you, when I do refactoring, I don't spend hours. I spend like 10 or 15 minutes. And if you're doing TDD the proper way, your refactor loops are so incredibly fast that you iterate down into well-written abstracted code in less than probably 10 to 15 minutes. So add that up across X commits, across X PRs, across X you know features. And yeah, maybe you have a couple of hours yeah, worth totally. of time that maybe. I've spent. That's not a waste because we're adding so much to our code base from a maintenance perspective. Right. I think I think one of the important bits to having a quick refactor loop is is having well written tests. Um, if if you've you know writing redoing your refactor and you're running your tests as you should, right? I, I change a couple of lines, run the <laughs> test, yeah, I'm clear there. Run you know, a couple more lines, run the test, we're good. If at any point you've you've failed the test and you're like, oh, I need to go adjust something about my test, right? You've missed the mark, right? You you've, you yes. have you have ended up testing the implementation and you need to take a step back and re testing that system, right? Because a, a proper refactor is not going to allow a behavior-driven test to fail, 
right? Unless you're breaking something with your refactor, you're, it's never going to fail. You're just changing the, you know, the internal plumbing of how your system works. You're not changing the, the you know, the, the expectations or the contracts of your system, right? So, so here's a here's a fun counter argument uh, that testing after is actually more wasteful. How many times have I written a mock <laughs> that I have to change 15, 16 ways to Sunday whenever a new feature comes along, right? Yep. Mocking hell is a thing, guys. It, I have spent hours of my life when I worked at, at a certain giant consulting firm, um, not the one you're thinking of, oh. but a different one. <laughs> Um, no, that was a small one. That one, that one was, that was small, a smaller small one and not mighty. Right. This one was very large. Um, and so I walked in and I was implementing this really cool, like I was writing in .NET and we had this really cool idea of developing a PowerPoint generator for some crazy ass reason. I don't know why, but we just did it. And when I was writing this, <laughs> I, I was probably crazy for doing it. But when I was writing this, I was so gung ho for mocking. I was like, oh, I just discovered MOQ, which was oh, like, yeah, yeah, the yeah. most badass yeah. mocking framework on the planet. I still love MOQ, I, I, by the way. Yeah. Authors of MOQ, yes. right? if you're reading that or if you're watching this, I am a fanboy of your product. It is an amazing piece of software. Yeah. It's, but it's, it's, actually not, it's actually not fair because it works now. Oh, it All the mocking frameworks work now. Yeah. Like that's the other thing that sucks. They it's didn't like, work. <laughs> the model really didn't work. And if, and if the people that wrote Rhino mocks are watching this. Yeah. I'm mad at you. <laughs> I know you're good. I remember that. Too. I went from like C sharp to Java and Rhino mocks was my first introduction to Java mocking and oh, like no. power mocker Makito. And I was like, Oh God. Uh, what's the <laughs> Um, so but back to my story. So I, I, I had just found mocking and I was so excited and I went and I mocked everything to the left of the class. We were doing dependency injection, which I had just found as well. Mm -hmm. And we were DIing all, you know, IOC. This was like when John Skeet wrote, yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody's like, yeah. Oh, John Skeet is the hero of Stack Overflow and all this and that. Um, and so I, I ended up mocking everything on every class. Now, let's just say I had to change implementation of a concrete class. It was like seven layers down, which I was really bad about that crap too. Back oh, then. Yeah, yeah. Instead of composition, I had like 10 layer class hierarchies uh, academically because that was the right thing to do. And so I'd make a change down in a concrete class somewhere and I like catastrophically break <laughs> at least 75 tests. And I'm like, dude, I just changed like three lines of code. I changed the greater than to a less than or something like that. And all of a sudden I have like 70 tests to fix. Tell me about wasteful, right? When you over mock your code base and you, again, a lot of this happens via testing implementation, which is test after not using test driven, you end up with an incredible amount of waste in your system. And I'm spending hours of my time fixing stupid MOQ implementations. <laughs> the setups that are like like 200 lines long right my right. set exactly if, if, right. if a setup is I, i'm gonna say this and it's probably wrong but if a setup is longer than like 30 lines you're probably doing it wrong yeah. um like tests should be tiny follow first you know the first criteria like all that all that jazz that you can google um but but you have to focus on building non-wasteful tests, which in my opinion, TDD allows you to do that because it forces you to test class stacks. It forces you to think about interaction. It forces you to think about tiny little things. And that refactor loop is just the gold of what you're doing. All right, so third myth, test-driven development can't be used in complex software. Um, you know, maybe you're right if you're trying to TDD the next machine learning algorithm. I've never really had much experience in that. But what do y'all think about this one? Complexity, the definition of complexity being multiple pieces of software that interact, right? Not necessarily like deep algorithmic things, which I think there is a valid argument a little bit that TDD isn't necessarily a good use for deeply algorithmic things. But I could be wrong. Have, did, have you guys done that before? What do you think? I, I tested a model I, I made for a very poor attempt at a, uh, a recognition piece of software. Mm -hmm. It was like, hey, is this a picture of blah? And I was able to test that because I was able to like output the model, put the model in the test, run it and say, this is that thing. Did you say it's that thing? Right. So I could do that. But I wonder too, if like, you know, how people define complex software is like an enterprise system. It's got millions of lines of code and all that good stuff. And my favorite thing is is going in and changing something and then running the test to see what fails. Yeah, for sure. Because who knows what fails? Like that's a perfect like superpower in a big complex system. It's like mm -hmm. I only know this tiny little bit. For right. sure, I, I agree with that. I think the the more complicated your software is in business software. What I'm going to call business software, I mean like web apps and APIs, right? 
I'm not talking like Google stuff that runs on firmware and nonsense like that. You can still TDD that, but that's a different conversation. So like web apps and, and things that mobile applications, stuff like that. I absolutely think that TDD is a, is a phenomenal way to test that because again, you're driving out behaviors. I'm hitting on this point a thousand times because this is what people don't understand. The value of the tests that were written in test-driven development is that you're developing tests that define behavior. You're not coupling your test implementation to the implementation underneath the covers, right? My, my master's uh, thesis at Georgia Tech was in software quality, and we have a paper where we proved out that you can still have a bug in your code, even if you have 100% branch coverage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, it's, because it's if, if you, it is a fallacy, because if you have a class that has internal state, which we don't want to do that in, in today's world, but let's say you have a class with internal state and each of those classes, their interactions are, are, are actuating the state of the internal object, you can cause a bug despite the fact that you have 100% coverage in a vacuum across both of those classes. If you had used test-driven development, you would have implemented a test that went all all the way through both classes and actuated both of the class stacks to prove out that you had a bug. And I actually talked to my professor about this and he was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, like 10 years after the fact, what do you, what do you guys think? What are some other examples? I think the, uh, Jesse, your, your example of the, you know, the machine learning model, right. That you just, you just, you created it. Right. And then you just took the black box. That is your model. You said, here's a picture. What do you think it is? And are you right? Right. That's a perfect example of behavior driven tests, right? Because yeah. I don't, you know, I've, I've taken some classes and whatever, you know, back in university on, on machine learning and, and whatnot. I couldn't tell you past the very basics, what the heck's going on in that model. Right. I, I couldn't test the implementation if I wanted to. Right. Yeah. But that's OK, because I don't care about the implementation. I care about giving an input and some maybe some set of state. What's my output? And if I just look at that and that's it, my, I can do whatever I want. I can change out my, you know, my neural network model for some other kind of model. Yeah. And it, it doesn't matter. Right. I can just see <laughs> look, this one still gets it right. And that's what I care about. Right. Okay. And uh, and I can't think of much more complex things than something like a, you know, a neural network that's been you know, trained and modeled and, and has been produced. Like I, I, I couldn't test that the implementation, okay. but I don't care to, right. I just want to see what happens when I give it stuff and what comes out of it. Right. And if you can treat all of your code that way, it's great. Right. Cause you don't have to worry about nonsense, like how complex my stack is or how, how many subclasses of subclasses I have because I hate composition or whatever. Right. Like it doesn't matter. I just have my entry point. I have my expectations and I just run it and see what happens. Right? Exactly. I'd love to, I'd love to see somebody like use, use, after test after on like hidden Markov models or some oh, yeah. right. <laughs> maybe some maybe some psycho out there has done that if you know of a psycho that's done that put it in the comments because I'm very <laughs> interested in in using TDD for like super algorithmic things because I I honestly don't have many other than what you've mentioned and what you mentioned Kendrick I don't have many frames of reference for that I've always been in like standard business software I've never well, well I got another one which is which yeah. was really funny because this totally bit me um mm. uh I'd written a test. So like I knew what I was sending to another service that I don't own. Mm -hmm. I was like, here's the payload. This is what it should be. Cool. And then I also had things of like, this is what they're sending me. Cause I can't, again, I can't control. I know what I'm asking them. I know what, this is an example. I took that, put it in my test. And all of a sudden I get a phone call. Hey, this isn't working anymore. I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? It's not working. And, I, and of course I go into a small panic. I'm like, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yo, what, what do you mean? It's not working. Hold on a minute. <laughs> I go and run against the systems that I, again, don't own. And someone had decided that a string is now an integer in their API. Cool. Which, of course, you know, JSON parsers have an opinion on that. That happens. Yeah. And that yeah. just broke my test. And I'm like, that's cool. So, you know, because I'm looking at you, Salesforce, um, <laughs> you know, made the, made, the, made the phone call to them and they switched it right away. But it insulated me from having to go on a goose chase. Yeah. Which was the other thing, too, which is like, I don't own that. I don't own all this stuff. I know what I'm sending. I know what I'm getting. Here's my installation between those. And yeah. that saved me hours. Of, like it took me all of five minutes. I'm like, oh, because I literally just took the payload, shoved it in my test. Works. You get the pay, right. It's yeah. another another danger of mocks is like when people write bad APIs. Oh, yeah. Maybe we should do a dev better on bad APIs. If you want to see a dev better on bad APIs, hit us up in the comments because I, I, would, I would love to talk to you about <laughs> some of the things I've seen. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure some of some of you all have seen some things too. But so. you have to send the whole payload every single time, <laughs> even though you've only changed two variables in the whole day. Right. Yeah, we don't implement yeah. patch. Yeah, patch no, no patch, patch, no, no post. Just if you yes. forget to set the, the password field, it's just going to wipe your password. And it's how about, <laughs> how about, how about this? That. How about this? 
Everything is a post. Agree. There's no, there's no, there's no post. There's everything's no, a post. Yeah. There's no well, gay. I, I had to, I had to send 1500 bits of information. What else am I going to do? I can't put all that in the query string. No, <laughs> what are you doing? I, I actually ran into that problem. A random side story. I ran into that problem when I worked for a client when back when browser uh, string links were twenty forty eight bits. Oh yeah. And uh-huh. I was trying to get fancy and send things on a query string because I didn't want to do a post because that's what people yeah. were doing and it was pissing me off. Yeah. And I, bro- I broke like a production system because yeah, browsers yeah. couldn't do this. I've, there, I've, there was like a small smattering of users over here in the ether, probably in the basement using IE six. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and Firefox and Chrome were cool with it, but IE6 was like, nope. And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. And they don't tell you either. It's not like that's no. too long. There's just like, sure. And you're like, it's because well, it, didn't it, work? it was written in 1995, back when we cared about 2048 bit, uh, you know, browser strings. Uh, technical implementations. Indeed. <laughs> cool. All right. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, Jesse, Kendrick, thanks for joining us. Um, Hopefully this has been fun for y'all too. We're, we're trying to keep keep these more light, a little bit more edutainment, uh, kind of developers ranting style thing, which is what I like to do. Um, uh, <laughs> I, it, it, if you know me, that's pretty much all I do. If you get me in a room as I rant about how things piss me off in, in our world. But um, hopefully you learned a thing or two about TDD. I promise you it is not a waste of your time. It is a thing you should learn. Um, even if you don't like the central philosophies of the red green refactor loop if if you're like oh i can totally write behavior driven tests without tdd maybe you can maybe you're like the most amazing programmer i've ever met and you can do that and that's awesome but i highly highly recommend that if you're a junior journeyman mid-level kind of encroaching upon senior in your career you should look it up and you should understand the philosophies that it's trying to get across you know, at Seven Factor, we try really hard to do TDD as much as we can. Not every client allows us to. We have to have these these kind of philosophical discussions like we're having now about it. Ultimately, we're going to do what the customer wants us to. But at the end of the day, I really think it's a huge, huge valuable thing for you to learn and for the industry at large to understand. So with that being said, appreciate you. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you guys watching. Jesse, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Always, always fun to have you. And uh, Kendrick, I appreciate you as well, sir. Everybody have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.